So to set the stage for today's program, Bill May, Global Head of Certifications and Educational Programs here at GARP, will provide an overview of GARP, the 2022 FRM program, and a summary of results from our recent global practice analysis, a survey-based study of the risk management profession. After Bill's presentation, we'll switch gears for a conversation with our FRM panelist, Tim Kadahi, Danielle Forney, Balaji Devarjan, and Bin Yun. Tim, Danielle, Balaji, and Bin have diverse backgrounds and will share perspectives on their career, current position, and how the FRM has supported their professional journey. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, and uh, welcome to all of the uh, attendees and, uh, and to all of our panelists. Just for a little bit of background, I mean, GARP, the Global Association of Risk Professionals, is a not-for-profit membership as association that's been in existence since 1996. We have a mission to um, advance risk management through education, research, and the promotion of, of best uh, practices. We have members uh, all over the world, from um, Shanghai to Chicago, from Mumbai to Madrid. One of the um, one of the big ways in which we um, achieve our, our mission is through certification. The the FRM, the Financial Risk Manager, is our um, is our is our major effort. Um, and it um, consists of examination, assessment, and then uh, professional um, professional experience. The examination part um, is a two-part um, test. The first part is the, the basics of, of risk management, uh, foundations of risk management, quant analysis, financial markets and products, valuation, and risk models. And then the second part is deeper dives into applications and specific areas of, of risk management, like market risk, credit risk, operational risk, liquidity risk, risk management from, from the investment management side, from the buy side. I mean, you always hear about risk and return trade-off. Well, it's, it's the risk that you're being you know, compensated for through return. So it's very important to have a firm understanding of, of that. And then current issues, which is where we make sure that our curriculum reflects all of the current topics, I mean, be it uh, um, the wind down of uh, LIBOR or FinTech or um, you know, climate change, we make sure that there's a, a, a special home for that in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the curriculum as well as embedding it in the, uh, in the uh, body of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, material itself. So, um, you know, what sets the FRM apart? What makes it the gold standard in its, in its space? Well, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a variety of things. I mean, one is that it's very much aligned to what industry needs. GARP is a professional association. Our board of trustees are high-level risk managers from a variety of different firms, industries, geographies. They oversee our organization. We have a similar oversight and advisory committee for the program itself. So we make sure that the program, its curriculum, what it covers is, is aligned to what the industry needs. We work with FRMs and risk practitioners around the world in developing the materials, the readings, the actual exam questions. So it reflects what the industry needs, what the industry wants. Um, we analyze the results of the exams and every single question and every single answer choice of every single question to make sure that it's fair, it's not biased, it, it um, you know it, um, it 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 accurately can um, you know sort of differentiate between those who who knows you know a, a certain topic area and those and those who do not and you know industry acceptance I mean you know the empirical analysis will uh, indicate that you know there are there are tens of thousands of of FRMs around the world and in all of the major banks, insurance companies, hedge funds, asset management firms, etc. So you know the 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 market. Uh, will uh, tell you that uh, um, you know the FRM is accepted as the gold standard. We have a continuing education program so that we don't just leave you at the point of certification. We stay with you throughout your career because we know that the demands on on you are going to evolve, and we want to make sure that we give you opportunities to keep your skills current. So the path to becoming an FRM um, is to um, you can register, you know, for the program. It's available on our on our on our website. Um, it, it's a self study program. We provide materials. We lay out the curriculum. We tell you what the curriculum is. We provide you with the materials in which you can learn. 
um, you've taken past the exams. We also make you aware of exam prep providers if you're interested in, you know, availing yourself of their services. Um, taken past the exams, two years of, work, of, of uh, relevant work experience, and you're certified. You're an FRM, and you can say that proudly to your employer, to your potential employer, to your, you know, colleagues. And then we would strongly encourage people to participate in our continuing professional development program. And, you know, it's a very vibrant thousands and thousands of uh, FRMs around the world are actively engaged with that so that we can stay with you throughout your, you know, throughout your career. So, you know, um, again, I, I would thank everyone who's joined us today. And uh, if you do have an interest in the FRM, uh, you know, please stay, you know, stay here for the, you know, for the rest of today's discussion so you can hear how it lives out in people's careers, but also visit our uh, website and, you know, look at some of the information and material that is there. And with that, let me uh, turn it back over to uh, to my colleague, Michael. Uh, that's great. Great overview, Bill. Thank, thanks very much. Um, so I'd like to now uh, re-welcome our FRM panelists. Uh, Tim Cudahy, Managing Director of Financial Risk Management at DTCC in New York. Danielle Forney, Director of Portfolio Transformation at HSBC in London. Balaji Devarajan, Vice President at JP Morgan outside Dallas, Texas. I should also mention Balaji uh, recently earned his SCR certificate. Uh, Bin Young, Internal Auditor at Vietcom Bank in Hanoi, Vietnam. Uh, Bin, we thank you very much for uh, being up late there in Vietnam and joining us. So I'd like to start uh, our conversation today by asking you each to share what you do in your current position, uh, what factors led you to the decision to pursue a career risk management, and how the FRM has been helpful uh, in, in the course of your career. Uh, sure, Tim, uh, thank you for having me here and uh, uh, happy to meet you all here. Um, in my current role at JP Morgan, uh, me and my team, we are responsible to calculate uh, the wholesale uh, allowance. Um, we use uh, models to calculate reserves under the CECL framework uh, for the wholesale portfolio on a quarterly basis. And, uh, um, you know, we review the results, uh, make sure um, it reflects uh, the credit risk uh, in our portfolio. And uh, um, we have conversations with uh, different lines of business, explaining our reserve numbers to them. Uh, we have conversations with the regulators and auditors explaining uh, the reserve numbers and why um, it makes sense in our balance sheet. Um, prior to this role within JP Morgan, um, I was within the internal audit team, uh, challenging uh, credit risk and country risk management frameworks. And prior to JP Morgan, um, I was a management consultant um, with Accenture and uh, with a consulting firm back in India. Uh, I was working with uh, different banks and financial institutions on specific risk management uh, engagements uh, related to credit risk modeling, uh, RWA or uh, Basel compliance, uh, enterprise risk management frameworks, uh, and such. Um, regarding my interest with risk management, I think it started early in my career. Um, or even before I had a career during my uh, high school and uh, college days, um, I had an interest in economics and finance um, during my high school and uh, undergraduation. Um, so I was within economics, I was interested in uh, resource management and how to optimize resource for the best use and the best outcome for everyone. And uh, during my, uh, post-graduation or MBA, um, which was right in the middle of the 2007-2009 global financial crisis, I had the opportunity to do an internship with uh, the Central Bank of India. So during my two months at the Reserve Bank of India, um, I did a project on operational risk, and uh, I learned the basics of risk management from uh, the regulators themselves. Um, I had great mentors there uh, who, from a regulator's point of view, explained the importance of risk management. And I understood it was not very different from my interest of you know, resource management and how we effectively measure uh, risk and uh, you know, put capital at the optimal use. 
Um, so it was kind of uh, love at first sight. Um, I re instantly liked uh, the risk management framework. And it was, I never looked back. Um, so from 2008, I, my internship till now, I continue to be in risk management, um, always learning new things. Um, there's always something exciting. Uh, financial crisis when I started, um, and then uh, we had the pandemic, for example, and we had the geopolitical concerns. There's always something uh, that is new and uh, it's keeping me on the toes. And happy to speak more uh, during this webinar. Yeah, great. That's thank you very much, Balaji. Um, Danielle, can we uh, can we move to you now? Of course. Thank you, Michael. Um, I work in London. I lead a team of data scientists and of software developers. We develop tools and capabilities and software specifically for portfolio credit risk managers and for relationship managers to make sure that they have at the fingertips the most advanced, the most useful analytics to perform their sort of like the risk manager part of their role. And before that, I was working as myself as a as a portfolio managers, always been between the project managers, the portfolio managers, and the data scientists. And uh, I've worked with the HSBC across Asia and then now in London. And before that, I was uh, in Italy with Deutsche Bank. Um, I was mentioning in one of the calls earlier that I always feel like the FRM was a very clean line in my career, whereby once I did the FRM, actually understood what risk was before I was, I always thought I was doubling or just like hustling with risk. But actually the FRM gave me the kind of, the kind of view, the 360 view around what risk is and what we, and what are the different um, frameworks or the different disciplines and practices that in my careers have really helped. For example, being able to be dropped in a call in a meeting and be able to converse about uh, what was the topic of the day. It could be like securitization, it could be market risk, it could be credit risk. So I, th I thought that was very useful, at least for me to get a, get a clean grasp about um, financial risk in general, and to some extent not financial risk. Great, thanks, Danielle. Uh, ben, would you like to share your um, your story with us? Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ding Nguyen from Vietnam, and I see I am quite young. I, I think I am the youngest uh, person in here, so I hope that uh, tonight I can uh, share, have some uh, useful advice for the students or young people like me who uh, still uh, um, concern how who started to want to uh, to uh, follow risk management as uh, for your uh, career um, about myself um, when I was fresh graduate from university I uh, been I have been to several positions in in bank like financial analyst then senior financial analyst uh, and and then I uh, I was a assistant to head of wholesale banking uh, which is really in in a business, then a assistant to a head up um, market risk and market and investment risk in in um, Techcom Bank is one also one of the biggest bank in Vietnam, and and then I try with uh, uh, with a position as the strategic analyst in um, the uh, strategy division, and after been. Uh, um, well, after working in several positions, I think I, I, I thought that the risk management is uh, very interesting and, and uh, very suitable for me. So I decided that I would, I would choose uh, risk management for my career. So I uh, went uh, studying for my master's degree in the UK. At that time, I also started to, to, uh, to um, uh, study uh, for FRM and prepare for, for FRM exams. And, um, Finally, uh, from uh, 2016 and to until 2018, I uh, I uh, got uh, the designation from FRM. So it helped me to have very good uh, um, educational background and knowledge, and be confident to be a, a good candidate when apply when um, apply for for my uh, jobs in in uh, 
in Vietnam, which are very competitive. And uh, and um, as you know, that uh, I uh, was uh, um, and and then I uh, I worked at um, an, a market risk analyst in Vietcombank. It it is uh, one of the uh, big four bank in Vietnam and the most prof profitable one. Every I think every students want to work in Vietcombank in in Vietnam, and. Uh, I uh, I I had uh, I had worked in market risk management for nearly five years, which uh, I uh, supervised bond and uh, and money market um, activities. We build models, we build policy and procedures, and then I also work on liquidity risk management. And after five. Five years working in market risk management, I I uh, decided to challenge myself to become an internal audit. Yeah, it doesn't mean that I I, I leave risk management. It's, for me, it's like an enhancement. Like I now I I am auditing what the risk management team and and the business team have done and uh, what they do to uh, for for risk management for our bank. And uh, I, I think with FRM, uh, I have the 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 insight. For the, the um, for for risk management, so that I can can do my work uh, better in reality. And sometimes my my work uh, needs that I like to uh, uh, to comply with international standards. So that thanks to FRM exam, that I think I can can uh, perform very well um, to my uh, managers and my colleagues. Yeah, that's a a, a brief sharing about uh, my experience. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much. We'll circle back with Tim once uh, we're able to hear him. Um, but I'd like to uh, delve a bit more into uh, the specific roles that you each have and how the FRM has been helpful. Um, Balaji, let's start with you. So prior to joining JP Morgan in the US, uh, as I understand it, you were based in India and had the opportunity to work on a variety of risk management consulting engagements for central banks, microfinance institutions, multilateral agencies in different countries. Um, maybe you could share a perspective on how risk management practices and the risk profession differs on a global versus regional level. Uh, sure, that's an interesting question. Um, I would say um, the banks and the regulators across jurisdictions uh, take risk management seriously. Um, the board, senior management, they all understand the importance of risk management as a core competence that they can leverage to uh, you know, meet some of their strategic objectives. Um, having said the similarity, um, there, there are obviously regional nuances. Maybe I can bring some examples first and then summarize why we see these regional uh, flavors. Um, I was doing a project uh, in, uh, uh, in in Sweden for a large commercial bank. And uh, they were implementing Basel rules, but the Swedish regulator, uh, you know, when they were adapting the global BIS standards into, you know, national rules, um, they had some flexibility uh, to tweak some of the capital requirements that are more suitable for their uh, local economic conditions. Say, for example, they want to discourage um, housing uh, markets for a while, then they would put a higher capital requirement for loans with uh, uh, you know, high loan-to-value ratios. Again, a similar example, when they wanted to promote small and medium enterprise businesses, um, they would lower the capital requirements uh, for such companies by a factor. So banks and jurisdictions are able to, you know, customize uh, the global practices to their, uh, you know, local requirements. Another example I would like to say is uh, some banks uh, in Asia, for example, their focus would be more on the traditional credit products uh, like uh, term loans or uh, revolvers. Um, whereas the banks in the West, uh, at least the large ones, um, they have this traditional credit product exposure, but they also have a big, big 
uh, chunky counterparty credit risk exposure because of their activity in capital markets and uh, because of uh, their activity uh, with uh, derivatives and market make. Um, so the focus would be on both traditional credit products and counterparty credit risk within the credit world uh, in a big Western bank, um, but maybe in Asia and other parts of, uh, uh, you know, let's say Africa, for example, the primary focus would still be on traditional credit pro products. And they may choose to, uh, you know, adapt a simpler approach to quantify counterparty credit risk. Uh, they, they don't need sophisticated Monte Carlo simulation models, for example. Whereas banks invest, they, they might need complex Monte Carlo simulation models for this area. Um, I, I, uh, stop me when I'm uh, taking too much time, but I can I can give one more example. Um, like banks invest are focusing more on operational risk, uh, at least in the last five to 10 years. Um, whereas uh, some of the banks that I worked with, uh, they tend to you know, use simpler approaches, again, for operational risk, um, probably because the lack of data or, you know, uh, the lack of uh, analytical, uh, you know, or scenario-based uh, approaches um, in, in um, you know, uh, in, in, in the Asian banks. Um, maybe one last thought, uh, again, as an example, um, we had a slew of regulations after the financial crisis, and some of them really targeted, you know, large banks like the global systemically important banks. But the smaller banks also um, benefited from those regulations. Um, so, um, like the big banks within India, for example, or big banks within a certain region, um, they uh, had a, a version, maybe a light version, of the global regulations. And these regulations helped put some structure to their existing practices. Say, for example, they did liquidity risk management even before the crisis, but now the regulations gave more structure to what they were doing. Um, so I think it, it differs in terms of uh, the intensity of uh, uh, these regulations, but again, to conclude, um, risk management is a serious business uh, across all jurisdictions. Yeah, that's great. It sounds like there, you know, obviously there are some nuances by by location in terms of risk practice. How has the FRM been helpful uh, to you in terms of bringing it all together or establishing sort of a baseline of knowledge that could be applied in different jurisdictions? Oh, F, um, yeah. So as, as Michael said, I started my career back in India. Uh, I worked with uh, different banks uh, in, in Indian Asia. So as a consultant, um, if I have to meet a client and tell them, hey, I can add value, I can help review your existing risk management practices and make it better, um, I need some credibility in addition to my experience. So when I tell them, hey, I'm a far qualified professional, um, they were able to recognize the certification and they believed in me uh, for the value that I can add. So um, when I did a project in Sweden or UK or in the US, uh, when I said, hey, I'm, in addition to my experience, um, I am also an FRM certified, um, they definitely uh, had some trust in me. Uh, they, they get the comfort that, you know, um, I have gone through the rigor of the FRM exam, um, you know, uh, and, and then I can really add value uh, there. And, and, you know, FRM being a global curriculum, um, you know, it definitely helped me um, with uh, the foundational understanding of the risk concepts. This is something which I did not study in my uh, MBA. Um, maybe I had some exposure, but not in the depth that the FRM program would cover. So uh, there are a lot of takeaways for me personally from the FRM exam. Um, and being a risk manager, these were practical uh, insights uh, that I directly applied in my work. Operational risk modeling or PD or LGD, I was able to connect with the terminology and, you know, and even after the certification, I still read uh, the GARP risk intel that they send me every week or every day. And then that keeps me you know, up to date on the latest. I know what is happening with other banks, what is keeping the risk managers up at night, 
what is that we can do in advance to you know prepare for those risk uh, emerging risks right. um yeah um uh, very helpful thank you thank you very much uh, balaji um so let's uh let's move on to danielle um so the frm Curricula in 2022 has a couple of current issues readings on machine learning and artificial intelligence. And, and Danielle, I understand HSBC is applying some of those techniques uh, in their risk management processes on the, on the portfolio credit side. Can you talk a bit about the various applications and benefits of machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, in risk management? Well, of course, thank you, Michael. That's, that's a great question. Um, the, the way that I, I see artificial intelligence and machine learning applied is mainly in two areas. One area is more in the modeling side, where machine learning and the sort of like the those kind of techniques allow for a more efficient, more accurate, faster modeling that allows to estimate values. Uh, that will eventually lead to an outcome. Give an example. Um, we, we can use artificial machine learning to estimate the um, probability of default, or we can uh, use machine learning to, to get more insights out of the data to allow us to make a better decision. And that nowadays has become quite common practice to do across different financial institutions. And the thing that often uh, people ask when they talk about machine learning, it is how much efficient, how much more efficient, how much more effective it is compared to standard modeling techniques. And that's usually a fair challenge because if you actually go down to the nitty gritty details of how much percentage improvement you get, sometimes it's very high, but often, especially when you go on the larger companies like multinational or large corporates, it's not so useful. It's very useful on the on the on the mass market, so retail customers, mortgages, credit cards, and so on. But when it comes to corporates, it's quite difficult to apply it. And so that's all we see. Then the second part of machine learning artificial intelligence, where we start to look at right now, is about early warning indicators and in general, um risk identification. So being able to crunch a lot of data, crunch a lot of market indicators and internal indicators that financial institutions or other companies have to get better insights and triggers to us as portfolio managers to see if we can act upon something that's up in the market. That is sort of like is an era that, at least from my experience, is still quite novel still being developed. There is, for a lot of people here probably are studying economics, there is a lot of questions about, is it correlation, is it causation? But the, the thing that really excites me is that it is such a green field that with little experience or little knowledge, you don't naivete, people can really make a difference. And that's very interesting. And uh, the organization I work for, they are, they are uh, doing a lot of it. Um, as I was saying, also applies for, for this side as well. You spend a lot of time, a lot of effort to find something, to look for something, but sometimes you don't find anything. Um, that's part of the game, it's part of uh, sort of like um, uh, fail fast kind of kind of um, attitude that we need, you need to do whatever you have to do with new technologies, but it's very refreshing working in special risk management where all of these techniques, all of these things are widely used right now. Right. So <clears throat> thank you for that. What, um, so what would you say are some of the data science or, or quantitative knowledge and skills an aspiring FRM candidate uh, should have or think about having and, and how might the FRM program provide that, that insight? I think that's another, that's another great question. So if you think, let's say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people that were in banking, whether it was in investment banking or whether it was in in the commercial retail banking. Everyone needed to learn how to use Excel or VBA macros. That was the basic that everyone had to know. Nowadays, that is reaching towards things like Python or R, this is a bit less, but Python mainly, and 
a lot of visualizations so tools software such as tableau click view uh, power bi there are many of them but essentially nowadays what used to be excel now is being replaced by these uh, more powerful and also more predictable kind of uh, softwares and the way that i connected with the frm is that um, i liked when bill was saying that today risk managers it is also a thinking role and value computational role and what i like about the analogy with data scientists is that data scientists allow to give tools to do the computation and the frm allow gives the tool to actually do the thinking about it, what to do about the data, the information that you get out of, the, out of, the, out of those tools. So I, I would connect it in that way, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. Actually, there's a couple of questions in the chat box directly for you, Danielle, so I'll ask those now. Um, how would you describe the um, awareness of the FRM in London uh, specifically was one question. And the other one was, uh, I think you've talked a little bit about it, how the FRM has boosted your career towards achieving your goals and what are, what are the best steps after taking the FRM? How would you, what would you recommend candidates do after completing the program? Uh, Michael, thank you. Um, the FRM is, is widely recognized and in, in the UK. Um, in HSBC, again, I don't remember numbers, but we're talking about thousands of people that work just in HSBC, they have the FRM certification. So it's, it's widely recognized. And the way that I think it helped me in particular is given that 360 view around financial risk and non-financial risk. And the, in practical terms, what really helped me is that I can go and talk to traders on the trading floor or corporate bankers and try and basically mimic how they talk about their risk that they have because have that background knowledge that FRM gave to me. And to, to, to sort of like to talk about a bit other things that I've done that helped in my career is studying um, data sciences, data science. So after, just after I did the FRM, I did a lot of courses uh, using R and Python. And that was actually very useful because that allowed me to do things much faster and to give, at the end of the day, it's all about giving outcomes to your organization. That's how you get a career, how you get recognized. And by using those tools together with the knowledge of risk management, allow me then to be, not this in my, in my own little world, of course, I'm not, <laughs> but, so that I'm still, I'm still in, in, in the middle of my career, but that really helped me to give me the quantit quantitative tool to be much faster and more efficient in my risk management roles. That's terrific. Thank you very much. And just to follow on the theme, there's there's quite a few questions coming in about how the FRM can enhance careers in different parts of the world or different organizations. Just to follow on what you were saying about HSBC, Danielle, I mean, I can tell you looking at the data, you know, we have FRMs well represented in all of the GSIBs around the world, uh, all the large consulting firms. Uh, as Bill had mentioned, there is great awareness um, of the program uh, globally in all regions. So, um, you know, I just want everybody to know that asking those types of questions that the FRM is, is widely recognized and uh, there are FRMs anywhere you look in terms of the large and smaller financial institutions around the world. Let, ben, I want to come back to you. Uh, we heard a bit about um, differences in uh, risk applications, regulations around the world. Uh, we know the implementation of Basel regulatory frameworks varies around the world, particularly in emerging financial markets like Vietnam. Um, can you describe how you have directly or indirectly supported implementation of Basel II or three frameworks at Via Combank? Yeah, Mike. thank you, Michael, for your question. Um, Maybe for some uh, developed market like in the US, uh, UK, or Singapore, market Basel is uh, quite popular and uh, already applied uh, for many years. But uh, in uh, emerging markets like in Vietnam or other country in our Southeast Asia like Laos or Cambodia, there are lots of things to do to, to, uh, to meet the requirement from Basel. A bit sharing about market in Vietnam, the State Bank of Vietnam required all banks have to follow Basel II from uh, uh, 2020. I, I just uh, mentioned about the past. So that at that time, like 
all the banks in in Vietnam have had to implement implement in, implement many transformation projects to meet the requirement from Basel II. So uh, uh, well, uh, with FRM, so I uh, uh, I had I proved myself that I a qualified member to join the. Uh, the the transform the battle to transformation project in Vietcom Bank. I joined the PMO means a project management uh, um, as a project management officer and also uh, uh, work uh, in uh, in projects uh, in market risk liquidity uh, market risk liquidity risk and into interest rate rate in uh, uh, banking book. Um, I had to. I, I read the Basel II and uh, figure out the gaps between um, our current context in the combine, uh, I mean the policy procedures model, and then how to close the gap. And with market risk, for example, in market risk, I uh, we we uh, do a uh, lots of things relating to value and risk. I think it's very popular in in FRM. It's a very po popular topic in FRM uh, uh, program. Uh, and also about the capital calculation. And uh, besides, we also work uh, in um, some bank-wide project relating to setting risk appetite, data governance, and so on. And finally, um, in 2018, which is like two years prior to the deadline from the State Bank of Vietnam, Vietcom Bank is the first bank in Vietnam to uh, to uh, officially announce that uh, we met the requirement from Basel II. And uh, I, feel, I felt quite proud and happy that I, I contribute maybe a little, maybe uh, more than that, that to, to that success. And um, um, uh, overall, I think what I have learned from FRM, which I have already told you before, it has me to have the foundation about international standards for risk management to work in uh, these above transformation projects and and then uh, how to implement them in reality. And uh, and I think when we now we are already closed though though uh, transformation project, but it doesn't mean that uh, we stop. I think. We have still have lots of things to do. We uh, met the requirement from standardized approach. So now we are uh, uh, doing things to to enhance to uh, to advance approach, and um, and, uh, and then we go, want to uh, to uh, pioneer to uh, to go to come to Basel three, for example, calculating LCR and and, and, and FR for like like. Uh, liquidity credit ratio and a stable funding ratio for liquidity for liquidity rates. Yeah. Great. They've been very helpful. Thank yeah. you, Ben. And so I guess yeah. it's fair to say yeah. that um, you know the FRM is applicable both in developed markets, developed financial markets, and also very, very, very relevant for folks working in developing developing financial markets and and, and providing that uh, uh, that global perspective and uh, knowledge base to, uh, to 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 you know engage with projects of of the nature you were engaged at via Bank. Uh, very helpful, Ben. So I'd like to uh, go back to everyone quickly um, before we get to the Q and A. Um, you each travel different career paths uh, and earn the FRM at different times. Can you talk just a bit about? How the FRM has complemented your your educational background, um, or not, I guess. But uh, assuming it has complemented, it, just talk a little bit about that. There's there are questions about uh, the FRM uh, and its uh, benchmarking as a master's program within the NERIC framework, um, and so I wanted to get some perspective on the FRM relative to your your prior educational background. Um, ben, why don't so, we start with you? Uh, sorry? Why don't you we start, start with you? Start, you? Start with you? Yeah. Start with... <laughs> sorry, I, I thought that you, you want to start with me. Okay, for my educational background, yeah, you see, because I'm quite young, so so that uh, in a for a very competitive uh, job, um, job um, very competitive market uh, for jobs in, in Vietnam, so it helped me to, to uh, to be recognized as a very qualified, uh, uh, very qualified applicant, uh, applicant to apply for a good job, 
And then when I was, uh, I, I, I mean, I started to for position, so it has me to be qualified for maybe uh, to uh, work in um, in transformation project, which usually requires that you have like very good background, good English, and understanding about international framework. And uh, and and then uh, I, I I think. Uh, it also have my 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 binds to 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 uh, to um, enhance like the um, the quality of the of the 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 the, the, the staff which I, I think now in in the combine uh, i think it's just only less than uh, 20 uh, uh, 20 uh, staff have uh, already uh, complete frm so with frm it it has me to be an an um, uh, outstanding um, staff in my bank yeah, and I think uh, because now I already moved to internal audit, so from FRM it uh, helped me to uh, to study uh, for uh, better for CIA, which is uh, the certified internal audit uh, auditor uh, um, certificate, which uh, have lots of, uh, of uh, requirement for risk management and also some quantitative uh, knowledge. We are which I already been through from the FRM uh, program. Perfect, thank you. Um, so, Balaji, I have a question for you uh, from the chat box that is relevant to this topic. Uh, and the question is the following, for someone based in India, is FRM enough to get a good career upscaling job offer in US or Europe or a master of science degree from a local US European university? Is, is that a requirement? So how does the FRM um, maybe, uh, I don't wanna say substitute, FRM. but enhance uh, those experiences for people in India? Yeah, FRM definitely helps. Um, if your target country is United States or UK, there are a lot of banks, um, in, uh, US banks and UK banks, uh, or European banks having base operations back in India. And they have risk management teams uh, also in India um, that cover EMEA, uh, Asia, and even global uh, operations and you know risk management functions. So if you have an FRM, uh, you are demonstrating your interest uh, to them and you can definitely apply to many openings that these banks have in locations like Mumbai, Bangalore, Hyderabad, uh, Gurgaon. Um, all these banks uh, you know, uh, like to uh, encourage talent. Um, like if you are interested in a, a risk management, if you have the FRM, it definitely helps. And all these banks, uh, recognize a forum as a qualification it again demonstrates your interest so it will be helpful um the ms is another route yes definitely helps um but um depending on your career uh, uh, not career i would say depending on your priorities are you willing to take a break from your career for two more years study abroad and then explore uh, your opportunities that is definitely a possibility um if FRM allows you to, you know, do your uh, specialization in risk management while you continue to do your current role, be based in India. Uh, so, so it's a question of your personal uh, choice at that point of time. But both are helpful. FRM helped me uh, in my case, I would say. Great. Thank you. And Danielle, do you have uh, anything you might want to add to, uh, to this question about um, the FRM relative to educational experiences? yourself um i if you talk about something that you actually my own experience that i learned and i could use the day after work the frm is great because it's really practical um, and I, what i found very useful um i, I also have a master a master degree in economics and that becomes more theoretical. It's a different kind of effort, different kind of uh, involvement, of course, because it's a, it's, a, it's a longer kind of thing. So it's, of course, it's a, either on weekends or, or during or, all day long as I did it. Uh, personally, I think the FRM is a great option that is very, very practical. And again, if a person is already in financial industry or in a corporate that in the treasury function or in the risk management function, it's uh, you can learn things that we'll use literally the day after you've learned them. 
So I, I thought that's why I, thought I found very useful. Uh, again, not to take away from a master that, of course, give you like a more like holistic uh, coverage of a particular topic, such as economics or finance. Of course, just different things in my mind. Right. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to just uh, let's just go to the Q&A box now specifically. And uh, I'm going to open it up to anyone that wants to answer these questions, including you, Bill, if you have a you know, perspective on things. Um, there was a question about uh, financial engineering versus the FRM knowledge base. Um, I mean, I know they're different, but I'd like any of you to uh, that has interest in replying to that uh, to go ahead and maybe talk a little bit about uh, you know, compare and contrast financial engineering versus uh, risk management, the FRM. Maybe Bill, you I could. Uh, that. Anyone try that, Bob? So financial engineering is targeted uh, on mostly on modeling and you know how you can use mathematical principles to quantify and measure risk. Uh, but while doing that, it definitely gives you some background on the risk stripes and what products and what risks you're trying to quantify. Uh, um, you, you, uh, the firms definitely need uh, financial engineers uh, in their team. Um, um, if you if you recall uh, one of the slides that Bill presented earlier, uh, there are different aspects of risk management. Like there is risk identification, uh, you know, risk uh, measurement, monitoring, reporting. Uh, there are different aspects of uh, risk. But uh, if you do a financial engineering, you set yourself for a uh, modeling or a quantitative research type of roles, uh, if, if that's what you're interested. Um, FRM, uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, gives you uh, the skills and knowledge um, across all these areas. Uh, like you would, uh, it'd be uh, you know uh, well versed with the regulations. How do you go about risk identification, including measurement? The FRM is also quantitative in nature. Um, it might not be as statistical uh, or as quantitative as a financial engineering program be uh, because that is specialized and targeted. FRM is still a specialized risk management program. Um, even when, when I gave the exam like eight, eight years ago, uh, it was very quantitative. Uh, I had to use my financial calculators, do options pricing, uh, you know, calculate uh, uh, risks uh, across uh, in the market, operational, uh, you know, credit risks. Um, so, um, they, I, I would say they are not substitutes, uh, but again, um, financial engineering is more targeted on the mathematical side. Uh, FRM includes, it gives you, it definitely introduces the met measurement methodologies and approaches, but it is broad in scope. Is what I would summarize. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. <clears throat> There's a question here um, from somebody at working at Qatar Airways, which is kind of interesting, and they're asking the relevance of the FRM in a corporate setting versus, you know, in a position in Treasury, for example, versus just specifically for the financial services industry. I mean, I, I can I can say myself, you know, we do have FRMs working in corporates outside of financial services. Uh, I've spoken to people that work in Treasury, and they found the FRM very valuable. Um, but perhaps others can weigh in on on the relevance of FRM knowledge in a corporate setting. I mean, we know risk management, both financial and non-financial risks, are an important consideration within banks. Uh, they always have been and are probably growing in importance in terms of relevance in corporates uh, around the world. So perhaps you guys can share some insights on that as well, the applicability of the FRM in a corporate non-financial setting, non-financial company setting. Any Anybody want to jump in on that one? I will give my two cents. Um, it, it, depends, it depends on the position of the co in the company. However, the usual, the, 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 the way to, to assess whether it's going to be useful is that are you are you having to do with interest rates? Are you having to do with, with um, financial contracts? Are you having to do with uh, markets? And uh, and are you having to? And are you exposed to volatility? If the answer to these questions is resounding yes, then yes, I think the FRM would help. If instead is a sales 
position or an operation position, then uh, it, it might be more, more difficult to fit in, or it might be the FRM might be, a, it might be a defi um, something that would allow you to choose your next position or your position in five years' time. It depends on what I guess what the person wants to do in, in their in their career. Uh, Bill, do, do, would you agree? What do you think? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I would just you know also add that. Um... I mean, a couple of years ago, um, actually, as a result of our prior um, practice analysis, we developed and, and introduced uh, a portion of the curriculum focused on liquidity and treasury risk management. I mean, you know, for the very reason that the sort of, um, you know, that side of the house, like the liability side of the, the business, I mean, is, all, you know, is very important. And we, we wanted to recognize it as sort of a a standalone. Now, I mean, of course, like a financial institution is going to be, you know, their treasury function is going to be, you know, somewhat different from an airline and, you know, and, and, and so forth. So I think that what we try to do in, in our curriculum and, you know, in all of our things is introduce, um, you know, core, um, core knowledge, core methodology, core techniques, which can be applied in a variety of different settings. I mean, be it a, a bank, asset management firm, a non-financial, um, you know, admittedly, I think that um, there is, uh, I mean, financial risk management is kind of so in, ingrained in what financial services firms do, you know, banks and asset management firms that, I mean, it's, it's hard to get away from the fact that, you know, our curriculum is going to be addressing a lot of those risks, you know, where you, when you look at your asset, you know, the asset side of the house, I mean, it's not the same thing as if you're running an airline. You know, bank is not an airline, and so there are, there are going to be differences there. But the core understandings of how to assess risk, what type of instruments you can use to hedge risk, I know that's going to be important on the you know in, in non-financial firms. How to finance it from a treasury side, you know, we we try to cover those in as basic and applicable way as 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 is possible. But what I would encourage the listeners out there to do is, you know. Go on to our website. You can download the curriculum. I mean, it's publicly available at, at no cost, and you can look at the things that it covers and think about, you know, how will this, how would this apply to the things that I'm doing or the things that I want to do going forward. Yeah, no, that's that's perfect. And uh, um, unfortunately, we're at uh, we're at our time limitation here. We haven't been able to answer all of the questions. There were quite a few that came in about um, registering for the exam. Uh, exam logistics, uh, pass rates, um, you know, those sort of things, how to prepare for the exam. I would encourage you all to, to visit our website to download the FAQs that we make available uh, on the FRM site to, uh, to better, you know, understand and answer a lot of those questions yourselves. The information is all out there on our website. We will, uh, we will go through the questions and try to answer others um, as many as we can, you know, directly to you all. Uh, again, we thank you for joining us today and, and hope, to, uh, hope to see you in the FRM community sometime soon. So with that, I'd like to also thank Danielle Balaji and Bin and Tim and Bill, of course, for uh, their very helpful insights on today's presentation. Thank you all.